You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. This episode is so jam-packed, it's going to be two episodes. I got to speak with two powerhouses at the same time, Dana Belcastro and Deborah Bergman. They are both heads of production at major studios. Dana is the EVP of physical production at Fox, and Deborah is the SVP of physical production at Paramount TV. They are also the co-founders of the Women's Production Society. Now, to me, this interview is what this podcast is all about. You get to be a fly on the wall as two friends have coffee and discuss very candidly the issues of the day. And the coffee is literal. You may hear some swallowing and throat clearing, and I'm hoping that is just part of the charm. These women are in the thick of it and hold a lot of power at studios. In this episode, we talk about their different paths to studio executive jobs, them starting the Women's Production Society, gender issues in the business, and how they have changed. And that's just this episode. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. Please go to the website and sign up if you haven't already. I promise I don't inundate you with emails, but I do send some to let you know what is coming up, and there are a lot of exciting things coming up in the next couple of months. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbay, and now on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Okay, here are Deborah and Dana. We'll start with Deborah. You'll be able to tell their voices apart, so I won't interrupt that. Here we go. Deborah, let's start with you. New well, York. first of all, let's say today you are the SVP of production at Paramount Television. Correct. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's okay, pretty how'd good. you get there? A New Yorker, born mm-hmm. and raised. Started off, I'm going to date myself, in the 90s, early, very early 90s in New York City when things were done very differently and there was barely any independent filmmaking, but it was there. And then I got into production accounting because I also felt like, let me get into things that a lot of people have fear of, like budgeting, cost reporting, union negotiations, union deals. These are things that a lot of producers are scared of. And I knew back How in the How did you days, know this in your 20s? My gut. It was my early 20s. And my gut, I just knew. I just knew because who wants to be financially responsible for a show or a project? No one. So you also true. Nobody wants to do that stuff. No one wants. That's so part of the job is fiscal yeah. responsibility. And so then there's this kind of alliance between creativity and financial responsibility, mm-hmm. which you're seeing more and more of, which has always been necessary. But a lot of times it's just they go, they go apart and then they come back together. So I just felt like, let me know what I'm talking about. Let me be a woman in the room that knows what I'm talking about and talk about the things that people are scared of looking at and talking about. So for whatever reason, that was, I gauged that, I don't know. I don't so you know. weren't afraid of it. You didn't think, oh, everyone's afraid of that. There must be a reason. No, I was Without, like, everyone's I, afraid of it. I'm going to do it. I was like, I had a, you know, I had the creative side of me and then I had this analytical side of me that was easy peasy. So I kind of said, if, if I was going to become a, a, a filmmaker and do the business aspect of film, which is what I knew I wanted to do out of college, mm-hmm. business aspect of film. Where'd you go? Hofstra University, like a good Long Island girl. (laughs) (laughs) I went on the four and a half year plan. I changed my major twice. Um, I graduated with a film film degree, communications, and a a minor in business and French, which I never used. French. And psychology, actually. Psychology, I had to throw it, because I had changed a BBA to a BA, Uh eventually, because I graduated with a communications degree. And then um, I had my first gig in New York as a production account, assistant accountant on a $2 million indie. And uh, there was no accountant. I was it. And I was the sole, I was, this was before softwares. It was on an Apple computer. I created a cost report from, from Excel spreadsheet. And I would get $30,000 a week cash messengered to me every week from this oh financier <laughs> real estate tycoon. To, and I didn't, and the producer was too cheap to give me a safe. Oh my so God. every night I would go back to my apartment or go into Penn Station to go back to Long Island if I was going to go see my family, and I would have the money kind of like glued to my body. <laughs> yeah. So Were these the fun. days we had to pay out the crew on yes. Friday mm-hmm. in cash? Yes, yeah, especially the Teamsters. Yes. Especially, well, it's always special. the Teamsters. Always Don't the mess teamsters. around with their money. And then I, um, after that job ended producers were striking New York because it was so expensive to shoot there. And I didn't want to go look for work in an industry, you know, in an area that just, there was no work and I was starting out. So I decided instead of going for my master's, let me jump on a plane and go get educated in Hollywood. Hmm. And so I did three suitcases on a plane, didn't know a soul. I came out to Los Angeles and landed my first job six weeks later on Reservoir Dogs with Quentin Tarantino directing. And I was hired as the assistant accountant and assistant production office coordinator. 
Both I, jobs. Both jobs. Wow. I did both jobs, but I worked. I worked from like 5.30 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. I would start before call, half an hour, open the production office, and then I would stay after wrap another hour while I was doing the accounting work. I had two desks, one in the back with accounting, one in the front with production, and I had two titles, and I did the job. You were totally doing two jobs. I was Sick. totally doing two in jobs. In two different offices. I was totally doing And then at the end of the day, I'll never forget this, the um, producer called me in his office and said, okay, we don't have a lot of money, so I'm only going to be able to give you one credit. Which one do you want? Figures. Um, well, and one paycheck. Yeah, and one <laughs> paycheck. And I, but I was new. I was happy to be working in Hollywood. You know, I was thrilled. And um, I took the assistant production accountant job because I was really, it was, numbers were really easy for me. Budgeting was really easy for me. Forecasting was really easy for me. It wasn't hard. And I figured that would be a good way to get into working with crew. They like you, you're paying them. Working with vendors, they like you, you're paying them. <laughs> you know, And then seeing uh, the whole process beginning, middle, and end through the eyes of a budget and then translating it to the set and then to the screen. And so I felt like that was a really cool way to see it all. And so I did that, and then I started doing that for a couple of years. And I moved up pretty quick as a production accountant. I ended up landing a job at Amblin at Spielberg's company, early days, Schindler's List, Jurassic Park, the original. And I was an in-house accountant for them. I did that for a year. It was great. And I think, you know, I was getting seasoned to be an accountant on shows. I was good. I was honest. I was thorough. And next steps would be to go on big studio movies. I remember I was sitting there with an adding machine figuring out how they came up with the fringe rates. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm done. (laughs) And I retired my adding machine. At a really early age. Because you were about to get stuck in that career. I was about. Big time. And then I uh, left and I said, well, if you want to produce, go produce. So I produced two short films with my own money. One was with my own money. The other one was with someone else's money. They called me after. We did the film festival, went to Houston, South by Southwest, and we got some recognition. And I now produced. So now I was a filmmaker producer. And then it was time to get into line producing, UPMing. And then that's when I was getting the jobs as an accountant where they were willing to pay me 2500 a week. Back then was a good paycheck. Mm-hmm. And I was saying no to that to say yes to that line producing, production managing <clears throat> job, getting paid you know $1,000 a week or $1,500 a week in the indie world. So mm-hmm. I had to leave the studio world to reinvent myself in the indie world as a line producer, production manager. But it was a long game. It was long. You knew yeah. you were... Going I was in that it. direction. It was I was going it. in that direction. And I was saying no. And there was times I was like, you know, feast or famine. Unemployment was running out, but I was holding out because I just knew there was something drive inside of me that was saying you know, no to that. But I always had the accounting to fall back to, mm-hmm. back on, so I can always be sufficient and dependent on myself. And I just started, and then I got a couple of opportunities. I was the production manager and auditor on a Sandra Bullock-directed $250,000 short film that Merrimax, back in the day, had given her. Um, And we did that with Matthew McConaughey, Sandra Bullock, up in Ventura County. It was great. And I got my feet, I got to use both jobs Mm -hmm. as the auditor slash production manager. And then that segue to another little independent movie for $250,000 called Sparkler with Jamie Kennedy and Freddie Prinze Jr. (laughs) And that was shot in Los Angeles and Vegas. That was where I was truly line producing. That was rough. I was being threatened by the Teamsters in Vegas, but I was in New York broad, and I didn't really care. (laughs) You could take them. I could take them, and then after that, I got an opportunity. I had a chance to get into the DGA. I got in the DGA in 94 or 5. I was in L.A. I got in the Director's Guild in L.A. because of a circumstance. I was doing the job as a UPM. I was producing it. It was a female director. Lisa Satriano was a first AD trying to break into directing, because it was a DGA show, because of that, I ended up getting into the Directors Guild back then. As a UPM. As a UPM. Coming from the independent, low-budget world, non-union world, it all of a sudden prevented me from doing non-union work as a UPM. And now, because of the DGA... And then you had to get the bigger jobs. Then I had to get the bigger jobs, but I wasn't really given the bigger jobs because I wasn't on the QL yet. So I was like in this really weird situation where I couldn't get UPM jobs because I wasn't on the QL in Los Angeles. QL is a qualifying list? Qualifying list. And I I couldn't work as a production manager because I was now DGA. 
Did you have to work out of town, or what'd you do? I did a little bit of both. <coughs> I ended up line producing. So I line produced in town. But the, you could do third area as you I could do third area. And then, I be, then this was like the birth of third area. This was the birth of low budget independent. Yeah, the mid, mid to late 90s yeah. when they started yeah. with the tier system, the low budget side letters. Right. So the IA came out with the side letters. DGA came out with the side Like all these side letters came out where you can do like, I forget the numbers back then. It might have been 7.5 million and under where you have like these different tiers for crew rates and you get some concessions. Up until then you could actually do a non-union movie of some size. Like I came up doing like $12 million non-union movies. But at that time, in the mid-90s, they started, the, the, the death of non-union kind of started because these low-budget agreements mm-hmm. came through. So you couldn't do a non-DGA picture because it was like a million-dollar <coughs> DGA contract. You couldn't do a non-union, you know, non-IA picture because it was a million-dollar IA contract. That kind of forced everybody to... Well, it kind of homogenized everything in a way. Yep. So, yeah. I was one of the, I'll never forget the first million dollar movie I wanted to do in LA. And I remember going to the IA. And I would go up against the IA many times and the Teamsters many times. And, and again, that's the negotiating. That's also doing the thing. You know, I found that fun. I would read their agreement and then I would look at my budget. This is prior to the tier system. And I would sit there and say, hey, I believe in health benefits and pension for all. Not just the actors, for all, for everyone to steps foot on a set. I still believe that today. Why don't we come up with a reduced rate for the three tiers? Let's do a tier system on the rates, take a break there, and then I'll pepper the pension, health, and welfare for everybody that's an IA crew member on the show, and we'll be a win-win situation. I'll be able to do it here in L.A., Let's come up with a negotiated deal. So we did. We did a side letter. And I, I kind of think that was lovely and amazing it was my first movie I did that with. And I was a co-prod on that one. And then like from that there, movie. that was a good yeah, little nice all-female yeah. cast mm-hmm. movie directed by a woman, Nicole Hoffson. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, around that time, that's when the tier system really started. And it, it makes sense. You know, I think all people should be getting their benefits. But yeah. it also takes a lot of the fun out of it. <laughs> you can't negotiate. You can't pit, you know, cities against each other. Like, we used to go into Cincinnati and then tell them, well, we're going to go to Baltimore if you don't give us a better deal. And then we go to Baltimore and say Cincinnati's giving us a better yeah. deal. And then you could just kind of like do a deal and then decide where you get the better well, deal. Well, back then go. you could go to them and fun. say, or I'm not going to go union. Because we That's were still too. non-union. Yeah. So you can be like, okay, I'm not going to go union. Yeah. I can't afford it. But let's got, try to make it work. I actually got organized once and it didn't work. Like the IA came and they convinced everybody to, you know, they, they did their thing and they did the cards. Remember, like the, 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 the crew had felt the card to determine whether or not they wanted to be IA and it actually didn't work. <laughs> they, they couldn't decided, organize you? They decided not to, yeah, the crew yeah. decided not to do it. That's funny. Because oh, we were funny. paying them fairly and, you know, I can't remember the deal, but yeah. And some of them didn't amazing. want to join. I yeah, guess. they didn't want to yeah. join because, and also remember there was NABIT, like there was IA and NABIT. Mm-hmm. And you could actually, I did the last NABIT show in New York, Green Card, and then the NABIT got absorbed by the IA. Okay, Dana, you. Yes. How did you get into this crazy business? Totally randomly. I had no interest. I, I didn't start out to do this. I went to college for English and theater, and I moved to New York right after college. I went to Syracuse, and I worked in the theater a little bit as a stage manager and, like, hung lights and did that kind of thing and did a little bit of performing, but I was terrible, so that didn't last very long. I, was, I think I did it for about a year or two, and it was so hard. It was so difficult because there's no money. Yeah. So it makes people really mean. <laughs> um, so I had a bunch of friends who were, like, in publishing. Like, they just started off. They were readers, and they were, like, assistant editors and stuff. And I was a big reader. I still am. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to go to publishing. So I got a job as an assistant to a literary agent. You know, people throughout my life have asked me about becoming an agent or a manager because I can talk, and I guess I'm kind of bossy. I don't know. But I never really wanted to do that. <laughs> So, Fuzzy in a good way. Yeah, I don't think so. But supportive whatever. is the word you I are. Think you are so. supportive. Anyway, so I did that for about a year, and then <clears> I thought I don't want to be an agent. I started to think about going to a, a publishing house in New York, and I started dating this guy who was an AD, who was the first AD on a show called Tales from the Dark Side in New York, which is one of those <laughs> shows that like everybody worked on. And I remember it was at Silver Cup, and I was working at the Flatiron Building in New York, so I'd go to work every day, and I'd have my little shoes, and my little skirts, and my little angular sweaters, <laughs> and I went to set to visit him once, and I remember just like, it was like they were in a basement, like this disgusting, dark basement on stage, and the women in this basement where like, you know, their hair was a mess and their clothes were awful. And I remember distinctly thinking, I would never do this. This is disgusting. This <laughs> Look is at crazy. their outfit. Ugh. <laughs> and then literally like a year later, I'm right there because I, this guy got a job because he spoke French. He went to school in France. He spoke French. He got a job on a like weird little TV show that was like a co-production, like a Luxembourg, UK, French, American co-production of the story of William Tell. 
And I was going to jump jobs anyway. So he's like, why don't you come over to France and, you know, be a PA? And I was like, okay. So oh I, speak French. Mm. I, I didn't know the business. I barely knew him, but I was 24. I thought, well, all right, why not? <laughs> so off I went. What happened to that guy? I lived with him for seven years. <laughs> wow. And I, so I went there. I ended up being there for three years. I was like a creative producer's assistant. I ended up being the creative producer's assistant and a story like quite a story editor, but I did a lot of coverage and I did notes. Wait, hold on. You were in France for three years? Uh Uh-huh. On and off, yeah. (laughs) It was pretty intense. And the UK, actually. And that first year, I cried every Thursday because it was so hard. Because my boyfriend at the time was the line producer and he was really mean. Mm. So I was the dog's body in the office. I was the PA in the office. Mm. And so all the girls in the office were horrible to me. Mm. (laughs) But why Thursdays did you cry? I don't know. It just happened that way. The the build up by Thursday. And I would just like, (laughs) I would just bust out. And I remember like, I would have to go down. We were, we were working in the South of France because for William Tell, you had to be in these like chateau towns with no phone lines and no, you know, like they had to, the locations had to be workable. So we would be working out of these like, castles with no heat in the dead of winter I had a little space heater and like fingerless gloves and I'd be typing and crying and I would have to go and food of course was a big deal Mm. (laughs) like it was and by the way it was French hours and I would have to it was fantastic actually and I would have to go wash all the dishes in the from the production office so I would have to like clatter down this like little tiny staircase with these dishes crying and like washing the dishes in this like ice cold water and remember, like Cinderella it was unbelievable at least this was my experience and I just remember thinking this is horrible next year I got a little bit of a promotion and the first thing I did was paper plates <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I was like forget this I'm not doing uh-huh. this anymore anyway so that was three years and then I thought I was going to stay in Europe forever because that's kind of where at all worked and what was interesting to me is I'd never done anything like that before but for some reason like living in hotels and traveling you know moving every month suited me like I didn't know it would until I did it but it was very easy for Mm -hmm. me for some strange reason so I did that and then at the end of that period I was trying to figure out what to do the tv show was done the one of the producers on the tv show moved on to a movie called Green Card that Peter Weir was directing with Gerard Depardieu, and they needed somebody to speak French to Gerard. And there was also, like, some financing from a French entity because it was Gerard. So he hired me, the UPM hired me to be his assistant. So I got lucky because I didn't have to do, you know, low-budget, crazy porn. I just said what like right to a like <laughs> yeah, porn. $12 million, <laughs> you know, kind of, it was an independent but it was like a really nice movie that uh, Buena Vista. It was Vista. a lovely movie. Yes. Remember? So, it's so opposite of me, the independent <laughs> world and the know, grunge right of there. New York City. Nope. You know, I remember one of my first gigs, I forgot to mention when I was in New York, was a movie called Frankenhooker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and my, I was an assistant location, <laughs> and I was doing lockup at 3 a.m. south of Greenwich uh-huh. Street. Yeah. If you have an idea, south of Houston. Uh-huh. Yeah. And like oh, yeah. that was oh, my God. job. Oh, lockup at like south 2 or 3 in the morning. And I just remember after that, I was like, no, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. Like, or I was doing... Uh, commercials like gripping because I did some gripping. I would just go work sure. for, you know, I worked for Subway fare or food mm-hmm. for free <laughs> sure. to go because you know totally opposite of her I'm where they actually paid you. Mine was yeah. just like sure. You need well, a by gripping. the way, Let me try it. First job, three hundred fifty bucks a week. That was it. That's all I got. Fifty bucks more than me, baby. Well, it's true, and it was cash. <laughs> oh no, mine was <laughs> the cash. Mine had to go through diem. payroll. I was getting per diem. At the get... end of the at the end of the year, I'd had like a thousand dollars in cash, like you know, sitting in an envelope. So relatively speaking, I was getting reasonably well paid and and it was a nice job the French show even though it was a very te- it was a terrible show in any case on to green card and then I you know because that was a nice show I made those connections and then kind of I was an assistant on Home Alone 2 and I was an assistant a, a couple more times and then I can't remember what the first supervisor job was I was working for the same UPM that had done green card uh, we were going to do a movie called I think it was Roommates that Peter Yates was directing and I was his assistant, and he was interviewing supervisors. And I remember these people would come in, and he would interview them. And he, right in front of me, by the way, we were sharing an office. And whenever they left, I'd be like, hire me, hire me. I want to do that. I want to do that. I'd be like, you can't do that. And I'd be like, but I want to do it. And, and it was just, I, was, I knew him. We'd done two pictures together. So finally, he hired me. Mm. And what was interesting is that I didn't know anything about it. And I had a great accountant, great accountant. So when payroll came around... Who's the accountant? Noel Bermudez. Oh, I love Noel. He was Noel. the nicest, so 
great. And I know that. Oh, I love Noel. Yes, we all. He's like oh, shout A-list. out to Noel. So I so the first time payroll came around, I went to my boss and I was like, ah, oh, payroll. And he was like, you're not going to be able to do that. You can't do that. And I was like, okay. So then I went to Noel, and Noel showed me how to do payroll, like how to you know figure mm-hmm. out the meal penalties and the OT and how to it is you know, possible. Prove it. Mm-hmm. And it real and what was interesting to me was, and I'm not a numbers person mm-hmm. by the way. It was so easy. I was like, oh, well, this is stupid. yeah, this is, <laughs> like, this is not. <laughs> and I, yes. So I had I had a <clears throat> like, what's real, all the mystery? Yeah, know, there's no mystery. That's mean, the point. He just said like, oh, this is really complicated, and and it did not help me in the least. But my friend Noel did. And I remember also not having any qualms about jumping onto the, like, the electric truck and yanging at the best boy about why his hours didn't match the production report. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, no problem. You know, And inevitably, they would just back off because you'd be like, here it is. This is what it says. Why is this a problem? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it's just a... You're right, you're right. Well, I was trying to steal money from you, but you got me. Yeah, exactly. so uh, so, guess I'll take it back. So that seems straightforward <laughs> as well. So it all, like, once you actually kind of broke it down, it just didn't seem that hard. That was always interesting. Like, and this is the same guy who told me I wasn't a filmmaker, like, you know, two years before. And once you're actually in it, it's really not that hard. Oh, it's, it's just you more know? about this, I don't know if it's a version of unconscious bias, but it's, it's very straightforward. Or at least it was in those days, too. And by the way, this is the mid-90s where a hard shot was an exterior rain shot. Like maybe right. with a car. Yeah. You know? Oh my God. Rain towers. <laughs> yeah. Baby lights. And I honestly I look at those movies now and I cry for how easy they were. Yeah. It was an avatar. <laughs> and how hard we thought they were. Yeah. <laughs> so then I just kind of, you know, I did that. I did a couple of supervisor jobs uh, with some really great wine producers who were actually uniformly very supportive and really nice to me and all men. And then um, I decided somewhere in the, what was it, the 98, 99, I wanted to wine produce. I wanted to make a jump to wine producing. And had a couple of crazy meetings with some people who, men, who said, oh, it's never going to happen. You can't do it. Like, seriously, you go into these rooms and they go, oh, you're never going to do that. Do they say why or they just dismiss they, you? They just, they're just very dismissive. Like, you can't, like, they just say, you can't do it. That will never happen. <laughs> you're just like, and I guess oh. half the people went, oh, okay, hey, I guess right. I'll go do something you else. You know, it's really interesting because on the flip side, not to interject, but yeah. because I came from production accounting, Back in the day, how they came up with the word line producer was to be responsible for the line of the budget, right? right? So I'm coming from building budgets, projecting budgets, and incorporating how the money translates to what you're executing on screen. So I never really got that. I got the opposite. I was like, well, actually, I am the most qualified to be a line producer. (laughs) Like, I will spend your money and account for every dollar and dime and translate that to the director and the creative producer. I should have said that. You should have said that. And again, it was coming from the place of strength, which is coming from the place where when I learned how to do payroll, I learned because I read the contracts and I had to understand them and I had to translate those union contracts into how you... You know, when you get the time card and how you interpret that with meal penalties and turn around and force call and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. it was like, oh, this is that and that. And like, it makes sense. And then coming from the set and seeing, I would go on set a lot. I was also an accountant oh, that went on set a lot. On set. That's I was an on-set account that would go two or three times a week, meet with, go into the wardrobe trailer and sit down and talk to the supervisor. Yeah. Go sit with the best boy electric and see the inventory and of the prop master. show me the chandelier yeah. that show cost me. $5,000. Exactly. Oh Where's the L&D and the why? Or have a conversation with the second AD as why you're calculating what you're calculating for turnaround and meal penalties. Like, explain it. So not only did I take the paperwork that was provided in the union agreements, and then I three-dimensionalized it, dimensionalized mm-hmm. it by going to set and seeing it. So I was never like that bookkeeper personality. I was like, I knew I was going forward. I knew I was taking this experience to the next job. And- this is the secret. It's doing the work and understanding mm-hmm. what everything means that you're yes. doing. And what I hear over and over again is that that kind of learning and then mentorship and like deep foundation isn't happening as much anymore. No. So you're getting no. people in higher levels that don't have that deep. They come through the desk. It's true. They come from the desk and God bless many of them. But I know for myself and being around a while in this business, when you have people like us that actually came from physical production mm-hmm. on set many on set. years, I mean, I spent 10 years as a line producer. I went from the early nineties. I got in the DGA in 94, five or six. I can't remember. And I went over to Sony Pictures in 2005. So those 10 years, I was a DGA line producer hyphen at UPM and did the job. And my niche was $12 million and under anywhere in the country. Mm-hmm. Give me $12 million and under, give me a script, give me a director, and throw me anywhere in the country, yeah. and I will make it happen, whether we shot there or not. And that was the fun problem-solving piece of it. 
you know, we would either bond it or not bond it. We would have a completion bond or not. And sometimes, I'll never forget one of my last movies, I convinced a financier to not bond it. I needed that money, that 2%, to go on screen. And I convinced him that by having me and my... AD and account that I required, we will deliver. That's you no are different. The bond. We, yeah. are the well, bond. we are the bond. We are yeah, the bond. Sure. And he called me out on it a few times when I started to get like pushback from the director on the show. A little bit like he wants what he wants kind of thing. Yeah. And he empowered me. God bless him. Tom Warner empowered me to go. Why? She said she can deliver this. I I back what she said. It was different in those days. I mean, I never felt like I was held back. I mean, aside from a couple of weird things, I'll I'll tell one more story. I I actually do feel like I was, you know, encouraged to some degree, and I I didn't feel so held back because I was a woman. I mean, a little bit, but really, no more than. I mean, I think it's worse now. I do think it's worse now since the crash, since '08. I do think that the men have kind of circled the wagons a little bit. Yeah, because there's a whole. You guys are of a whole generation of women who really. Did it? Yep. Yeah. And I never really felt. I mean, this story. The the first time I supervised that same movie, <laughs> I was getting a thousand bucks a week. And I remember <laughs> when we were talking with the bond company and we were going through the budget with them. The only comment he had was, "Hey, the supervisor is getting paid less than the second accountant. Uh, second assistant accountant. Is that right?" And I remember sitting there with the, my my you know line producer and I was looking at him. He was like, "Oh yeah, that's right." And about halfway through the show, when it was clear that I was doing a really terrific job, I went to him and I was like, I need more money. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, you've got to give me more money. Good for you. And he was so, like, he personalized it. Like, I thought he was going to burst into tears because, I mean, a deal's a deal for one thing. But secondly, he just felt really weirdly threatened by it. And I Why are you fun- more grateful? Something like that. Mm. And I, he gave me an extra 100 bucks a week. So I made $1,100. <laughs> Good but job. I'm, you know, getting my rate up has been a constant annoyance, like, ever since. Because I always, I started mm-hmm. with a really crappy rate. Anyway, so I did that. And then wanted to jump. So I decided if I couldn't, so line produce or go into a studio. Because I figured, theoretically, that the studio, if I did, like, a, a studio job for a couple years, that would get me to line producing. So I got lucky. I got the new line job. And, again, I figured I'd be there for two years and then, you know, segue out. And certainly at the end of the first year, I remember thinking, oh, time to go. Because that's how long a show lasts. Yeah. And there's, like, this weird internal alarm clock that's like, okay, time to go. But I really liked it. It was really civilized. It was really rational. We were very bottom line driven. So it all made very, you know, it made a lot of sense. It wasn't too crazy. And I ended up staying for nine and a half years. <laughs> and made it to senior VP. Started off as nothing and then became senior you know, VP and then senior VP. And then uh, I did a bunch of big movies and small movies, pretty much everything, really. And then when New Line got absorbed by Warner's, like 950 of us just got, you know, thrown out into the street. Wow. That was super interesting. So I had thought, I thought, oh, I'll just get another job because I always worked. Yeah. But How what hard could it be? none of us understood was that the marketplace had changed dramatically and it was a wait when the crash happened and there was no work. So it took about nine months to get a job. So I line produced a show called Burlesque, which First was Sony. really difficult, <laughs> but I learned a lot. And then did some line, you know, did some budgeting and boarding and came close to a couple other line producer jobs that didn't work and then, or didn't happen. And then I got a job as the head of production of a small independent called Evergreen Studios, where I co-produced a movie called Walking with Dinosaurs, which was also extremely difficult, but again, learned a lot. What did I do after that? Oh, then I got Alcon. So then I became head of production at Alcon, which was great because I was finally running my own show. I mean, I was kind of running the show at Evergreen, but I was really the, you know, I was like the president of me. So Alcon was great, though. I had a little staff, and they were wonderful, and I got to make Blade Runner, which was amazing. And then um, I got the call from Fox. So now I'm So we didn't say now you're EVP of production at Fox. Now I'm an EVP of production at Fox. Yay. And working on Yay. many movies. Features. And now uh, features, and about to get absorbed by Disney. <laughs> so I have a little new There's line that. PTSD. <laughs> it's the, the You're future, a little. That's you right. it. The future is uncertain. We will see what happens, but we it's uh, it's you know can't complain. And so after I did the ten years at producing, which was very opposite. It's funny because we're kind of an opposite experience. Mm-hmm. Like for me. I just kind of did it. I believe if you're going to do it, just do it. And I was in the indie world because I left the studio world as an accountant. In the indie world, you you could, if you're honest, I believe, and have a skill set, you could continually get hired. And I was continually hired. There was one year where I was boarding and budgeting everything and nothing got going. 
In fact, I, there's some companies out there that owe me tens of thousands of dollars because with Indies, mm -hmm. you know, you will get on the hook. You'll do the work. They'll ask for budget revisions and plans over and over again. And then the money's coming, the money's coming, the money's coming. And then six weeks later, four weeks, you know, eight weeks later, like there's no money. And you're calling your agent. You're like, wait a minute. Hello. Like, hello, I'm, I'm not going to do more. I've had three. Uh, they were Broder, Broder mm -hmm. back in the day, mm -hmm. like Jay Gilbert and yeah. Hillary um, Group, I think. Yeah, Gersh yeah. back then. Uh -huh. And then I had um, ICM when I did my Sony deal. Oh, okay. And then now right. well, I was with APA. So I've had a few, and I think it's just about That's people, the people, more about the people. So I did that, and then I got married in 05. Two days after I got married, I left my husband and went to Chicago to produce my last feature. <laughs> oh, uh, let me let me just interject. Uh, my husband and I got engaged in 98, no, sorry, 96. We moved into a house that summer and two weeks later I left for six months to go on a show in New Mexico. <laughs> yes, so, same thing. So production works. <laughs> yep. So, and I just remember I was gone for six months in Chicago and I remember saying to my new husband then, here's the deal. And it's, I was lining it. It was small. It was ambitious, Will Arnett. It was directed by Bob Odenkirk Ooh. and uh, Will Arnett, Dak Shepard. It was great. Shy McBride. It was a great cast in Chicago. What was the movie? Let's Go to Prison. Mark Abraham was a creative producer. He was phenomenal, and he had a lot of things going on, so he wasn't there a lot. So a lot of it was on me, which was great. So I was kind of straddling both, which I did well. I loved working and nurturing creative, which was the director. And I was, you know, the budget part, the, that was so easy. It was maybe 5% of my job knowing yeah. where the money was because I was so, well, so I could really right. focus on giving him what he needs. Mm -hmm. So two days later, after I got married, I went on a plan. I remember saying to my husband, okay, here's the deal. I will not be able to come out to see you for six months because I'm going to be sequestered. If you want to see me come out every two weeks, and uh, he was working nights then so and weekends, so he can only come out during the week for 36 hours. So the beginning of our marriage was like, you know, six trips during that six-month span yeah. in the middle of the work week where we were trying to connect with this new relationship. Yeah, it was just like... <laughs> it's a miracle. And then I remember leaving that gig. It's you know, a miracle. <laughs> and I remember calling him midway saying, I'm wrapping June, whatever it was, I'm wrapping June, blah, blah, blah. And, okay, you've got two-week window there. Book a honeymoon. Yes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you plan it. I'll show up. I don't know what's going to happen next, true. but do it. And you know, I think I was home after that show. I was home for like a month, and then I took off, and then I went to the Bahamas for like three months. It was the same thing. I was like, okay, got to go. Bye. Yeah. And I was gone. So, oh, these he, long-suffering husbands. Yeah. I know. He, he's, but then I, got the, then I got the staff job, and then he was like very happy. So it took a while, but... He tolerated it for a while. Too. Yeah, my husband didn't say anything because when we were dating, I was freelancing. And then when we got married, I was still freelancing. Yeah, yeah. And so then he knew what I, he got into. Yeah. He knew what he got into, yeah, and that was it. Yeah. And I, by then, I had gotten, had a reputation in the indie world as someone who could do anything anywhere for any dollar amount. So I was continuously getting scripts, going from one gig to the next. It was one year I had three movies at one time. I was wrapping a show and prepping a show. Simo, it was, I had similar, my team, and it was great. It was great. I was burning out. I was burning out. <laughs> Labor of love. It was love. wonderful. I was dying. I was burning but producing out. producing is more fun. I mean, there's no question But I was about also that. burning out yes. because anyone who said that low budget independents were easier than big Come studio on. movies is, and I know people that have said they it, don't know what men they're talking about. that work Never in the studio that. business thought that. That's nonsense. And I'm like, that is not true. No. It's that is not way true. Way harder. It's yeah. so much way more harder. challenging yeah. when you can't throw money at a problem and you have to figure it out. And you have no support school. also. You have no support. Like, and no cover. Like, there's nowhere to go. So, my last movie was with. Uh, Carsey Warner, they were getting into the film industry, film business at the time. Their head of BA reached out to me after we wrapped that show and said, hey, would you consider coming in-house? It'd be great for you. You're newly married. She was, one, she was phenomenal. She was great. And it was like, huh, interesting. And, and what had happened was none of their pilots got picked up, and so they weren't going to be adding. They were actually getting rid of people. And it was during the time when they let go of a bunch of people in their TV department, TV division. But the seed, I think, was planted in my head to go in-house. I never in a million years thought I would go in-house. I am a production person, on the ground, I make it happen. I'm a production person, too. But yeah, uh, and then Sony so was looking for a VP of production, physical production, and features. I took a meeting a couple of times and got hired, and I was there for eight years. And that was where I experienced yeah, well, a the lot. Being a token woman, right? That's like, where like I experienced Iron glass right ceiling, boys' club. That was mm -hmm. I had never experienced it as a line producer before. Did they ever do that thing where they went to a sporting event and not tell you? 
because they do that at like Warner's all the time. I didn't actually, know they it. apparently they had done it at Fox. I, I like, got invited a few times to events. Time. Like I, they would go, they would go to a baseball game and not tell the women. So like Kim Cooper and, and Liz Sarah would just be sitting around going, "Hey, where is where everybody? Are? Yeah, and they're just like gone. Don't even get invited." No, apparently not. I mean, it hasn't happened in a while, but somebody's telling. I mean, Kim could corroborate, I suppose. But yeah. Well, I will say also, though, back in the early days when I was producing, there was such a, uh, the, the balance of male to female behind the camera. I mean, there were many times when we were doing a shoot and I was one of the only oh, women mm-hmm. behind the camera or on a tech scout, which Ugh. was like, the tech scout would always be the joke. It would be me as a line producer mm-hmm. and maybe the set decorator yep. was a woman yeah, and maybe. that would be it. And so, but you never really, for me, when I was line producing, I never really noticed that I was a man or woman, never really noticed then and you the had some difference. power in those situations. And you had That's power, true. That's true. but you never really noticed. It was really getting the right person for the job, and predominantly a lot of these heads of department jobs back in the 90s, very early 2000, yeah. were men. Construction coordinator, special effects sure. coordinator, Stops. gaffer, like all these people that would be part of the tech scout, like heads of department and mm-hmm. keys, predominantly men. It wasn't until I mm-hmm. went in-house and I was the only female executive across multiple departments where I really started to feel the difference in my gender. And what'd that look like? That was (laughs) (laughs) the exchange. No, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Six months into that job, Dana and I really started connecting and talking. Mm -hmm. And this is, this was the birth of the women's production society. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember reaching out to her and us having a lunch together and me saying, there's no way I'm going to navigate these waters, these, these waters with all these men. I need female support. I'm like getting emotional. When was that? Like it was, cause that I was, already, that was like, okay. like, no, no, I started Sony in 05. So oh, okay. it was, it was, I started in August of 05. So it was probably around December, like the first quarter I was there. We had lunch or we had talk. We started talking about it because yeah. they were doing these women. How did we even meet though? I can't remember. Cause I, I don't know. I've been an executive those, for Five years or so. So I'd already been in the chair for Through the um, film finances used to host those women nights. That's right. That's right. Those women nights they used to host. I'm getting emotional for some reason. Just reliving. So only because it's a big deal. It is a big deal. It it was a really big deal. It's a shock. It's a real shock to the system. So what that looked like, the long and the short of it, was every bit of self-worth that I had as a person was just shoved down. Every time I wanted to contribute or be of value to the process was negated. And so what that does to you as a person, it just, especially for someone with my personality, which is wanting to be part of the team and such a collaborator, coming from independent filmmaking, being the collaborator. And with so much success under your belt, you had proven it. It must have been so jarring. And and being an effective person, like being prevented from being effective and was very, was very, it was very, it's really diminishing. It was diminishing, was suppressive. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like what's going on in the movement today with this, this harassment piece of it. There's this whole other arm about just suppression of women in the workplace. And did you recognize it as that at the time or did you first think, what's wrong with me? That. I yeah. first thought, what was wrong with me? That's true. At first I was like, whoa, whoa, because I really did. Well, I'm missing a skill. I'm missing, because I really did, you know, being the oldest daughter, being the oldest child, being raised from an Italian dad. I really did believe that women and men were 50-50. Mm-hmm. I just did. I just thought we were really 50-50. And then when I got in this environment where I saw this disparity between, wait, we're not really looked at as 50-50. I'm actually, it's more like 20-80. Like I'm being shoved down or whatever it was. I started having a lot of physical reaction. My husband at the time, God bless him, because he got the ripple effect of what was going on for me Monday through Friday, mm-hmm. 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. And then cultivating relationships with Dana and other women that did the job back then it was just the minors like really having that support of people around you that you could vent to when things went down but not really having the voice to say in the room what was really going on yeah well I had the opposite experience because there were other women in my department and the two supervisors we had at New Line were very supportive and so there were, I, I didn't have to live through that but I could be a mirror to Deborah to tell her to let her know that that's that wasn't normal. What she was experiencing wasn't normal because I, and I it was wasn't having, her. It wasn't her. That it was the system because I was having the exact opposite experience. Like I never had at New Line that experience. It was very supportive. We were doing our job. We were you know our our two supervisors gave us a lot of cover, a lot of protection. We were respected. You know I was probably underpaid a little bit, but whatever. 
like not not wildly underpaid. So I, you know, I could be kind of a, a normalizing kind of echo chamber for her because that wasn't right. It was mm-hmm. ridiculous. You could say it's not you and it's not normal. No, it wasn't normal. Oh, and then and then like during that time, I decided to have a child. So now right, I'm like that at helps. that. Which, now but, you're the pregnant lady. Now right. I'm the pregnant She's lady. So and actually, it. not only that, it took us a little while to, so I had to go through certain things, like be jacked up in certain hormones in order to get pregnant. Great. So now I'm sitting in staff meetings and in rooms, the only woman jacked up on hormones, uh, just trying to keep a lid on <laughs> and trying to be in my body. So when I hear these two people go at it, these two men go at it, and they're having a pissing contest about something, when all you want to do as a woman is get to the solution, yeah. like yeah. cut clarity, through the fat clarity. and just let's move on or off just of get it. get the work done. Mm-hmm. Just get it done I really had to like go inward and like find my inner strength as a woman Mm -hmm. and the power of aligning myself as a woman which was and I look back very very powerful because when you have outside issues you know affecting your body that you have no control we all know this men have hormones just as much as women Mm -hmm. men have hormone swings just as much as women but I I literally was jacking them in my body to help (laughs) me get pregnant powerful man they're powerful I really refrained a lot and I learned a lot about myself as far as being a very strong woman like str- I learned that I took the positive out of that and then when I left that job I was the first to go in a restructuring ladies first I like to say <laughs> ladies first <clears throat> and I immediately two days later I was on an interview for another job I didn't let grass grow under my feet yeah I went out there and I just started and I was debating whether I was gonna go back to producing going back in house I had taken over a couple of movies I took my kid with me on location one time for one of those movies with my nanny. I tried that out. And then I got the gig with Xbox. Xbox Studios was looking for a head of production consultant. I had never done television. I had no desire to do television. They were, you know, with the gamers. This is like a pioneering thing. Like nobody had that job. Nobody had that job. And I was offered, they were doing a feature for Halo, the game. Mm -hmm. And they were going to release it in chapters. And at the same time, that feature was going to be a series with Showtime which hasn't gotten made yet, and they wanted someone with my experience, and so I went, and uh, I was getting into it, and I went up to Microsoft a couple of times, and you know, saw that whole world. Was really... that a real bros atmosphere? Um, gaming was a woman. There, there was a woman. Well, oh, at the gaming, cool. there was, at Halo, the game, there was a woman who was the point person. Yeah, kind of. It was fascinating to me, because the way they do stuff is very much like we do stuff in production. Things are on timeline. Things are a deadline. We know what we're doing. And I respect that. They know what they're doing out there. They're the best at what they do, and we are at what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you can handle the merging of the two different formats combining together, then you could be successful. I I think... It's a huge industry. It's huge. There's a lot of money, although it's changing, too, like to an iOS, you know, from a a console version to an iOS Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So because the consoles take... Games take years to make. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars. But the iOS thing, bing, bing, put it on iTunes and be done. So I did that. Then Microsoft decided it was time to shut it down. had nothing to do with me. And then I was out of work. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to be a mom. I'll try that out. And that lasted two months before I landed the job as head of production of scripted series of Fremantle, where I was SVP head of production. And that's where I got to. I had a show called American Gods for stars. I got to set that up, help it get greenlit, and then oversaw the first season of that with Brian Fuller, Michael Green. Which is awesome, by the way. Great show. (laughs) And um, that was an experience because I wasn't set out to go do television at all. I just took as much experience as I could from my feature world and try to implement. And that was, I had Melissa Harper, head of production at Stars, who we did it with, kept telling me, you know, television is not all like this. If you can get through this, you can get through any television. <laughs> it was your trial by fire. That it was, was my trial. That was a famous show. People talked about that one. That was. How messed up that Fremantle of it all was. It wasn't uh, as much of the Fremantle of it all, it was, it was just stars? every little thing. No, Stars is great, phenomenal. Yeah. Shows like that sometimes. It's I just that lost. was just like everything like and Titanic. anything that could have gone wrong. <laughs> everything and anything that could have gone wrong on a show went wrong on that show. Yeah. Okay, that That's were out of our control and in our control. I always think if you start the show during Mercury Retrograde, you probably don't have a chance. <laughs> Not to sound like a California hippie, uh, but I've seen it happen so many times. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how hard people work, it doesn't matter how great they are, it whatever how much they can care, go wrong goes wrong. Sometimes it's just going to go south, mm-hmm. and you just have to be able to kind of. Put your head down and get through Mm -hmm. it and then get on to the next Mm -hmm. one. Okay, let's talk about the Women's Production Society. Let's do that. What is it? What's the origin? How did it it start? So I will backtrack for a sec. So yes, so I was at Sony. Uh, Dana was involved in this women's 
cocktail hour that film finance paid for, and they would gather a bunch of people. No, we were doing, it wasn't film finance. We were just oh, doing a kind of free form, you know, it was like Dara and yeah. Chris, Chris I remember Bonham, this, yeah. Dara Weintraub, and it was just like cocktails. Yeah, it was and just like it cocktails. it started off as like UPMs and line producers as a networking thing, and then inevitably, because we wanted to be inclusive, you know, then everybody could come assistants, PAs, and then it just became too big and too unwieldy, and I was losing interest, yeah. so we just kind of segued out of that. So, but I had, yeah. you know, and I had gone to a couple of those. I met yeah. Dana there, and then I, so I started Sony. So I was in Sony in this very man's world, and I, I needed support. And so I reached out to her, and I was like, let's call up all the female production, physical production execs at all the majors, and some of the minors, and let's have a dinner. Let's just How start. How many were there at that time? Eight. Was yeah. the first meeting. I mean, I knew, well, she called me because I knew a few, I'd been in the seat longer, so I knew them. I could, I could reach out a few more than she Well, there were some so, I just co-called to. Yeah, so we... So there yeah, were, so, so the first were, dinner. Yeah. Who are they? So at Whitney Luke's. Green yeah. was at, at Disney. Disney. Sarah Spring was at Paramount. Mm-hmm. Georgia Kincandis was at Paramount Vantage. Right. Shelley Strong was at DreamWorks. Liz Sayre was at Fox. Right. And then Jane. Kim Cooper was at Fox, but I, I can't I remember if Kim was there that Kim first time. No. Then it was Ginny, Ginny and Janet from HBO, yep. and Donna Salone. I don't think she was at the first one, but she was with Lionsgate, so she was, she was not at the first no, dinner. No, Whitney Green did not come to the first one. Remember, she came to the second she one. She came to the second one. Yeah, and that's she right. Made a big splash. But that yeah. was kind of. I think that was kind of. Oh, and Kelly. She Smith, paid for it. <laughs> Kelly oh, Smith, that is a big splash. Kelly Smith Waite was someone I co-called. Oh, right. She was at Warner's, mm-hmm. and then no one was at Universal at the time. Right. So there was no that's female right. exec. Right. Wasn't it cool? And then well, cool. Kristen, yeah, no yeah, one was then, there for yeah. years. I mean, right. there's 20 years yeah. in between. Yes, yeah. it was between cool. Yeah. And I actually went up for that job. I remember after New Line, and they hired a man. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of it. So it was basically all the majors and Lionsgate and fit HBO to a booth. At yeah, <laughs> we had a booth at Luke's, and that was it. And then Focus Features. Jane Evans yeah, was at that Focus was at the time, but she didn't yeah, but make she the first know. dinner mm-hmm. because no, she was, was based out of New York. These were just the ones we knew. Like it was yeah. just a few people it was just, that yeah. we knew. And what was really crazy? But we was kept that it at the majors. It was mostly yes. the majors and a couple of the minors. There well, the HBO a, girls. That was the it. HBO and Lionsgate. Yeah. yeah. But she wasn't the the No, she, but she was invited, but she yeah. didn't make it. So we. So what was interesting? So we didn't know anything about it. We just thought we'd have some dinner, and we did. And it was like the most fun we'd ever had. Like everybody was really great. Yeah. Like we loved all of them. Like they were really we were smart, very really like-minded. Fun, like-minded, and really cool, wives, and, mothers, yeah. working in this environment, having the, hearing the same conversations with our colleagues. We have so much in common. So much yes. in common. So what was interesting is that it had no. We didn't think anything of it, but when it came around to doing another one. We just wanted to do it because everybody was so cool. Yeah. Like we just wanted to hang out with them. Like we had no purpose. You made new like, friends. Yes. Well, we made was, new friends. I think it was. I think the purpose. We did have a purpose. It was supporting each other. No, the it's purpose true. was. I, I felt better for weeks after hanging with these gals. Yes, yeah. because they because were because so it great. empowered Absolutely. me to get through the weeks yeah. with this mm-hmm. de- this imbalance of male to female ratio in the workplace, behind the scenes, and in the in the corporate environment. So I. To me, it was a huge takeaway, and I took it. It was a lifeline. It was a, it was exactly well, that. born of necessity, really. Born and that, that's what's interesting is that you have this issue, and the first thing you do is reach out to other women, mm-hmm. and then it kind of gets fixed a little bit, like which is kind of, of against stereotype. It is yeah. very much so. Like, You're supposed to be backstabbing bitches. Well, and we're we're, we're competing not. with each other theoretically too. Like we're but that, that's you know, so that's so you know that's so just not the case. And I and you know being the heart of this, uh, it's like <laughs> having had a sister who passed many years prior. Mm-hmm. The importance of sisterhood to me is so important. Yes. Just having the, the solidarity mm-hmm. among your peers that a man cannot 100% relate to, for me, is the whole point of life. Just yeah. having that. And so. The sisterhood is huge. It's, ma- it's well, really huge. And, and I've never experienced that stereotype where a woman's been problematic or bad. I mean, very rarely. Every yeah. now and then you get somebody. But for the most part, I mean, you, yeah, so you live for your women friends. Yeah. And I, I can't do without them. You They're live, like, yeah. Only, I mean, yeah, men are okay, but the women are, <laughs> who, <laughs> sorry guys, but you know, I mean, that's, that's how you get through your life. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I couldn't do it without. So them. we were, so basically what it was is it was always upon us to set the dinner. So we were doing dinners. It was, you know, one time it was three times a year or two times a year. It would be on and off, but we would run these dinners and we, and then it Every started. And then somebody else would do it. And like, someone I mean, would yeah, take over. Like HBO Sarah. one year took over and they paid for it. Fox one year took That's over great. and paid for it. And, and then gradually the group got a little bit bigger and we started inviting. Like 15 somebody. of us. 15 Which, of us. Which by the way, let me just say this. On the entire planet, on the entire planet, there are only 15 women doing what we did at our level. Like, that is ridiculous. 
That like that's, ridiculous. I mean, it's impressive, one, but two, it's embarrassing because well, just there are the perspective, a million of them. How many Seriously. jobs are at that level mm-hmm. doing that job? And I remember at that dinner, oh, that I'll like never forget. 50, I mean, yeah. there's a lot. A I'll lot. never forget that dinner, the one you're talking about. I think Fox hosted it, and we, we, we oh, made yeah. this comment about how many of us are the breadwinner. Oh, and, my God, And yeah. every hand Everybody? went up but one. <laughs> Mine. So, but but that's okay. But we all yeah. went. We were the we were the breadwinner yes. for the family. We were, you know, the husband was home with the kids or being a right or whatever, and then we were the one providing the health, welfare, mm-hmm. pension, and the income to pay for the mortgage. And it was just like that was an eye opener. Nobody really knew that. That is fascinating, yeah. also. And were most of the husbands stay at home dads or artists? Some were, some were, and some worked, but just didn't get paid like we did because they were in real yeah. industries, and we get paid silly money in our business. Yeah. You know, do management basically. Yeah. I mean, Wait, what did your husband do? He was uh, a best boy electric, and then he and his gaffer uh, on a movie called Barfly invented the Kino Flow. Well, that was so, smart. Yes, <laughs> the, the, the dream of every guy on set. <laughs> so they have a factory now in Burbank, and they make Kino Flows all day. Oh, that worked out. So. Yeah, and at the time, my husband was doing management down at the docks before he. Retired from that mismanaged industry, yeah. by the yeah, way. God, Number God, one God. dock in the country, wow. very mismanaged. He Down burned out. Beach? Yep. So what was really interesting about my husband, and I'm just going to segue this just to give you an idea of yeah. me and him um, and his support, is when we had my son, he was burning out heavy in management down in Long Beach. He worked at a company called ITS. He managed about 100 longshoremen and crane operators there at the port. He was burning out. They were working 12-hour days, five days a week, but it was so mismanaged, not by him, but the people above. And we had my son, and when it came down to, we were looking at the numbers of full-time care versus his salary, and we met with a financial planner and an accountant. They were like, you know what, if you can do it, he should stay home. And he was at his ends with the job and he stayed home and for two years my husband who's six two he's a man's man who's a man's, a man's man you've man. met him yep. who now owns his own company a general contractor which he created from which scratch. he created from scratch stay home for two years and took care of that three month old when I went back to work and so we had a shift in the dynamic of the provider and it was he stepped up God bless him we did get him a little help so they can set the stage of what's to be expected when you're running a house. Yeah. And, you know, he stepped it up, and it was rough. And he knew he couldn't do it. He had to go, he had to, go back to work. And for me, I didn't realize the stress that, that came about being the sole provider for three mouths and a mortgage and all that. So and there, the changing dynamic of your marriage. Of the marriage. It was rough. It was a rough year. The first year was like, A, Having a newborn Ugh. is a change. Yep. And then B, having the shift in responsibilities and taking that old stereotype, the man comes through the door yep. uh, and the woman provides the meal and the slippers. This was the opposite. Mm-hmm. And But he didn't do that because w- when I would come home at 7 p.m. at night, he had this look of like, get me the heck out of here. He was all Because <laughs> we know that job is actually harder. Harder. Oh, my gosh. But then did you still have a big percentage of the home responsibilities or did you he take all that on? He, yeah, was he like, what's for dinner? Honey? Yeah. No, he, I will say he got to a place where the house was organized, the kid was washed, fed, and dinner was on the table. Wow. God Man. bless him. God a shout out him. to my husband. Shout out okay, to my husband. Okay, it wasn't Brian. all the time. Monday through Friday, but there were times when that was. But he, 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 he eventually got to seek to do that, which, you know, God bless him, God That's bless amazing. him. amazing. But I was still doing all the household stuff. I was still doing all the scheduling, and if things came yeah. up, like... Oh, the but, emotional labor. We have a word for it now. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of rough for the marriage, but we did it. And, you know, there was a, a shift for us. And then he went off and started his business, and I continued to work, and my career continued to change and... And, you know, his business is now doing well, and we're kind of a peer, and it's great. And we, we were just talking about that last night. That's what started the conversation, mm-hmm. just kind of like, you know, if anyone, you can stand in solidarity among us women. Yeah, like, he knows. You don't, it's not just about us women standing. It's about men and women standing together saying enough is enough, where this disparity of male to female ratio in all industries is out of whack. Yeah, yeah. why don't they want the help? That's what's interesting to me. The, the thing that always confuses me about the disparity and the, dis- the you know, inequity, and, and we've talked about this with the WPS and how we support each other in getting jobs, and we, you know, we, we have an open network, and if somebody hears about a job, we tell each other, and you know, we encourage each other to get it. But it seems to me that with sometimes with the guys, like they feel that if I got a job, if I got a good job, they don't say, oh, good for you. If you can do it, I can do it. They think that I've literally taken something right. away from them. It's mm-hmm. a very personal 
competitive approach. Like if Deborah gets a great job, I'm like, oh yeah, good. But it seems, and again, I'm making a huge generalization here, but there's this weird sense that if I got the job, they, I took, I literally took something away from them and they're angry and competitive about it. And that, well, I know, find that bewildering. There's that quote, when you're used to having a uh, privilege, equality can feel like, what's that phrase? Equality feels like a disadvantage. Yes, yes because yes. They're, now they're all angry. Yes. Somehow, like, like, if take it's all equality, now that's threatening them. Yeah. When, in fact, all we want is the same break as opposed to, but they are interpreting this, and again, huge generalization, they're interpreting this as now they're being uh, oppressed. Uh, oppressed, which is, of course, not the case. But right. they, yes, that's their perception of it. So, so then going back to WPS, Women's Production yes. Society, just to yes. segue back. So we had been doing these dinners for a few years now. We were getting bigger and bigger. I think then HBO hosted, we were at 21 one year. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, just more about, we were doing our own solidarity among each other. That's and then right. it became a great resource. We could share information. The, there was a brain trust there. There was a cone of silence there, a dome of silence there. Mm-hmm. You know, you could pick up the phone and call any one of us, whether you had a big relationship, you know, like a relationship like Dana and I have, or you just met them at one of the dinners. You There was a sense of solidarity. honesty and solidarity mm-hmm. and confidence. And the sharing of information, I think, is pretty unique. Sharing too. the information in a level that you... Yes, and let's be clear. There's no insider trading here. Yeah, there's no insider trading. Yeah, about... no antitrust laws. It was <laughs> more kind of like, broken, but... but it was just like it sharing, just like sharing, yeah. sharing like how do you shoot in Budapest? Yeah, like, like that, like, like exactly. You know, like, do, can you, you know, do you know a gaffer in the UK? Like, yeah, stuff like, like, like you're not holding on. Yes, to it what do you think of this? Power. Like, if you had to choose exactly. between these two production service companies in uh, Budapest, what would you do, and right. why? And, and then why, to have that conversation and to really get good visibility on certain things, which would like you know make us more efficient. At our job. Oh, saves yes. you so much time. If time. You don't have to research us. Yeah, and then eventually Which we would have to do in any case, but it, it, this just made it easier. Yeah. So what had happened was after my Xbox experience, I now started meeting a few people in television. So now I was meeting this whole other class because prior to 2014, mm-hmm. prior to 2014, it was primarily features because that's what we focused mm-hmm. on, and mostly majors except for a few indies. Yeah. So so it was, so it was kind of small. It's like this 20 to 25 yeah. number, and then I started in television. And I met some incredible females: Melissa Harper at Stars, Liz Miller at CBS, Sarah Fisher at ABC, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my god, these women are amazing. I spoke with Janet Carol Norton at ICM, who's head of. Um, she deals with TV line producers. She, I had a new relationship cultivating with her because I was now in television. And she was, I told her about our group and kind of that we were here to support each other. And she was like, oh, my God, you need to meet this person, this person, this person. I would literally would call them and say, Janet thought I should meet you. Let's have lunch. And we did. And then we included the television execs in our in our group, which then rapidly in the last three years, between television and digital, we're at 85 strong. Wow. Crazy. And so, and it really is a senior level physical production exec position from VP level up. So we, a year ago, we started to do a few things. Actually, a year and a half ago, we started to take on this whole production supervisor position because there's 120 production supervisors that are working out there in our industry of which 70% of them are women and they've been trying to get recognition within a union or guild because yeah, aren't they in between they, they have no, they don't get benefits they're one of the few non-union positions besides PA they're pretty much like the only non-union position on a show anymore because you know, most of the line producers came from the DGA as the line producer position was created over the last, say, 30 years. They've retained the UPM title, credit, residuals, etc. So they fill the hiring requirement from the, the bargaining agreement, and they start to bring up coordinators, assistants, location managers, whatever, to become supervisors to do the UPM job. So they come so they've from... Been, they've been in this limbo, and I was a supervisor, so I know this supervisor. very well. They're in this limbo where they're not covered under any agreement. They have no residuals, and they have no benefits. And, and they, go, they don't get paid very well. They don't get paid. And they don't get paid very well. And they're in management positions, and they're hiring people, and yeah. they're negotiating deals, and they're yep. dealing with union issues. And so what's the problem? Well, the, the problem, problem is the, DGA. the director. <laughs> they don't want it. Yeah. They so, so anyway, so there's an anybody. opportunity for membership within the guild if they absorb this class of people where they can widen the female, female membership. membership in management positions. So there's an opportunity for the director's guild to do that. And also they did expand that their UPM roster because currently, at least from our perspective, and we're talking with, we're, we're t- speaking as people with like, you know, that 30 years of experience in studio hiring positions, the DGA UPM Ross right now is a little slim. So and it's going to fade we have, out. We have hired supervisors. 
And so we, you know, this is an issue that's come from the supervisors for years. They've been trying to push in the DGA, and the DGA has pushed them out, pushed them back. So now as studio representatives, we're taking another approach and saying to the, UPN, the DGA, we want to make these hires this. Like, because, coming from the studio, this is how we want to do it. Because, because for years, the DGA has said, oh, the studios don't want it. And also, really and also, how do you train up UPMs? The DGA's old position is its second ADs or the the pathway for UPMs, right. which second ADs or pathway for UPMs well, first. and first. Yeah. But when we hire UPMs, they're coming from, you know, I came from accounting, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. there's, they come from, from coordinating, the yeah. they come from the office. So there's different location managing now. So there's different places of management where they would come from. And the set usually is not the place where a manager would come from That's because right. That's kind of not the skill set. You're not when you're on set running a set. You're not negotiating deals. You're not hiring right. people. You're not. There's a lot you're not doing. And, and by the way, specifically, ads are their goal is to serve the director, not the budget. Right. I mean, it's a managerial position. They have to be aware of it, but they don't think that way. And it's not against the director, them. not no. at all. So you know the level of complication that most movies have now. You know, we just feel that the ad. Route is not the best training ground for and it's really that never position. Been. I mean, it's you not get, been in the you know, last look, three you years. have the experience with the schedule, fine, but you know, scheduling, whatever, it's not that hard. I'm sorry. Anyway, the position we're taking is that the the job description has changed. It's you know, ad the ad route is not the best training ground for this position. It's a management position. It represents the studio's interests. We are the studio. This is how we want this to be structured. So, are you saying so. supervisors should be in the DGA, or we're supervisors that, should be yes. UPMs? Correct. They should both. be both. We're, We're saying, saying they, they should, absorb depending, them. Depending on their level of experience, depending how many days. Yeah, they have to get days. They have to, to do, in order to get in the DGA, you have to have X amount of days as yes. a UPM. We think so there should be a pathway, pathway to the U DGA UPM position as supervisor. As a supervisor. The same as there is for a second AD or a first AD. Now, is our supervisors right now mostly women? The 70% 70 70 of the 120 that we know of, 70% of women, and then there's a lot of diversity on the other side. So... That's just an interesting telltale. That is interesting. What it's else? a really interesting Not that we telltale. Can draw a lot of and, and by the way, but most line producers are men. So there, I you know, interesting. most line producers are men. Certainly, the ones who are doing movies over hundred million are men. You know, there are a couple of exceptions, and they're One. hiring. Well, two, two, um, and they're hiring women to do the scut work. Now, I love to be do the doing, doing the actually they're technically doing the production manager. They're work. absolutely doing the yeah. production manager work, but it's not the sexy stuff. Like the line producers get to interact with the director, the producers, the, the actors. The UPM does the crew, does payroll, does you know, yeah, which is what the supervisors doing. Stuff. So they're yeah. doing the heavy lifting. They're, they're the not getting lifting. the union benefits. That's right. They're being stuck. But here's the misdemeanor, and, and they're not getting the residuals. Here's the, the misdemeanor. Yeah. Here's the misdemeanor. So the misdemeanor is coming from Sony and now Paramount is we will, if asked by the supervisor when hiring them, we will pay them their benefits either through the IA if they were a POC coming up, we'll pay mm -hmm. their eight seventeen. Eight seventy one benefits, 71 benefits 71. or we'll pay them as associate producer through the PGA. PGA. So we will do that. Fox will not. Certain studios won't, but we will. The indies will do it. Certain studios will do it, but we will try. We're not not going to pay somebody their health benefits. Right. There's you know when but everybody on the set is getting a PGA it. PGA deal. Then well, they're Fox will allow it through the PGA, but they won't allow them to be paid through eight seven one because their perspective is that it's not it's fraud. They're not coordinators or yeah. supervisors. The coordinator gets their yeah. you know, benefits through 871. So anyway, so this has been kind of like a... Okay, so we found a gap that needs to there's be There's a gap. Fixed. There's Correct. a gap. And apparently this gap has been on the table for 20 years. Oh, God. <laughs> so this is something that's been up and talked about for 20 years the between DJ the DJ and the studios. And pushed it back. So All right, we, so let's get on with it. That's right. We're going... So we as, the, as studio people are, going, are now going to uh, try to address it. You've been listening to part one of Deborah Bergman and Dana Belcastro on The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I will be putting out part two of this interview on Thursday, so you get a twofer this week. I'd like to thank them both for sharing their stories, and special thanks to Kate McDougald for editing, Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbay, and subscribe and leave a review wherever it is that you listen. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters. For added features, bios of our guests, and the merch, please go there right now and subscribe. I'll wait. Just kidding. I'm not waiting. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Other50% and Instagram at Other50% Podcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.